Welcome to the Yacht Business Podcast. I'm David Fuller. In this episode, I talk to the team from Aquator Marine, a company that is making the business of managing a yacht simpler through digitization. I sat down with Gerben Visa, CEO, and Keegan Leslie, the business development manager, to learn more. But yeah, why don't we just get straight into it? You know, maybe Gerben, you can start with yourself. First of all, as you can hear from my accent, I'm originally from the Netherlands. I was in finance for about 12 years, uh, predominantly in uh, the Netherlands, the UK, and in the US. Then moved to Singapore uh, 10 years ago and been in startups ever since, predominantly in the financial technology space. And then uh, back in 2019, I wanted to go back a bit also to my first love, which is boats, because I've sailed most of my life and fairly competitively, especially in the UK. Uh, with also teams and really seeing behind the scenes how, you know, some challenges around managing a yacht and crew and project and, and projects around that. So that gave me a bit of a first-hand experience in, in managing yachts. And then, yeah, indeed, back in 2019, I, I thought, you know, I, I, I think the learning curve I have and had, because we still have some f- fintech startups, has been very useful Um but also, therefore, going back to my first love of yachts, I think there's a lot of commonality in the re- respect of looking at a uh, yacht from an asset perspective, or if you look at it from a stakeholder analysis. And and then separately, you know, we did back in 2019 a landscape of all the software solutions out there. And also really talking to a lot of the different um, users from owners to yacht managers, charter guys, crew. And just understanding, okay, what workflow, what tools do they use? I think what what came very clear was that there's a, quite a lot out there, but it's all very specialized in particular or, or trying to address particular issues. Mm-hmm. And so, if it's either purely on the maintenance or if it's purely hours of work and rest within compliance. Now, and that kind of whole analysis we did, and, and that landscaping and, and with terminology like heat mapping we did, became about you know the business model for a quarter. So that's that's kind of how it all started. I imagine the the biggest piece of software was probably Excel, was it? Yeah, exactly. And and it is very interesting actually when you do that user testing and so forth. You you get uh, from the weird and the wonderful. So indeed, you get people say, you know, yeah, but logbooks are in paper that's been done for centuries. And uh, why uh, don't change the winning team or you know don't fix it when it's not broken? But indeed, I think regarding Excel, it's still widely used. But in the end, I think Excel serves a very good purpose for financial modeling and so forth. But it's not how you you do project managing or trying to keep track of uh, equipment of an uh, of a large vessel with all the complications or the the details uh, um, required. Excel has a, has a great uh, it serves a great purpose, but but not really to to manage the art. Keegan, you've you've also got a, a yachting background. You started at started at the bottom, I guess, in a, in a way. Tell us tell us your journey. Yeah, exactly. So I kind of bring bring a bit of a fresh perspective to Aquata. I mean, obviously, Herbin coming from you know the financial sector, banking, startups, uh, and, and, and tech and things like that. I come from more of a crew perspective. Yeah, very right. I started out as a deckhand, worked my way up to chief officer on uh, you know fifty sixty meter yachts. Um, I, I hold my, you know, chief chief officer 3000 MCA ticket, you know, so I went through the whole rigmarole of getting all of that and everything. And, you know, throughout my career, I've managed some some big, you know, multi-million dollar refits done charters from the Bahamas to the Med, all up and down the Caribbean. And actually, quite interestingly, I did a, a crossing actually from Spain to Angola, which was very interesting. Uh, dodging pirates and having security on board was was. Was was a th- three weeks of hell. <laughs> yeah, interesting. From a product product point of view, it's always it's interesting to uh, to make sure that you have someone you know who's who understands the customer, as you say, and can build a product that that's responding to customers' needs as opposed to designing a solution and then going looking for uh, looking right. for a problem. 
You're absolutely right. So it's identifying very clearly what are the problem statements and what solutions are out there. And then sometimes most importantly, how do you look at an, a batch of problem statements so that you can really provide a broader value proposition? So, and I think within yachts, luckily, because the yachting industry is quite niche and you can really uh, identify clearly kind of, especially from the stakeholders regarding a yacht. And let's, let's look at yachts, say 24 meters and above, eh? so classified as super yachts. So if you look at what does an owner, what are the, the challenges re regarding an owner? Eh? That might be on the reporting, the financials, the understanding of tracking and, and monitoring of how crew is progressing. Then also, how do you look at it? What are the different problem statements or challenges that a captain has? or indeed the crew, or perhaps on the shore, the, the yacht manager, yeah, or from a surveyor and inspection perspective. And so I think if you look at those personas and you really look at their profile, what are their roles and responsibility in respect of a vessel, you can quite clearly uh, map out what their activities are and then also seeing, okay, what are the solutions they're using and, and where are their ways to, to improve that? So I think that, and that's of course with software quite uh, quite uh, interesting. And also I think if you look at how software and how users these days use software, uh, yeah, that has moved on and 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 um, and can be very you can be now very customer centric with software. And so and that's um, that's also what we tried. You know, there are a number of these software principles that we're really applying within uh, within our platform. Yeah, but you still need to have it in such a way that. That it's efficient, that it's not yeah. taking. Uh, I mean, I, for example, let's use. Uh, you know, I've I've used various CRM systems, and I know that you know, yeah. and, and from a sales point of view, most salespeople hate using CRM systems because it's yeah. just a admin they'd rather not not do, even though it's important yeah. for the rest of the business. So I guess you need to incorporate it into the workflow in such a way that the whoever's using it is not saying, "Oh, do I really have to update yeah. the system." You want the software to work for you and not that you're working for the software and, and therefore around data inputting or the challenge is, I think, if you look at complex business processes regarding yachts, how do you simplify that in software, first of all? And, there, and then secondly, from a customer perspective, how do you make it intuitive and easy to use? And then, you know, then you talk about um, the user experience, the, the, the design and, and so forth, so that it's that it's that people find it pleasant to work with the software and, and optimize it according to their needs. And therefore, you need to be able to, you know, the, the, the software need to be able to, with a high degree of personalization, decide that we also offer, for example, even custom development for, for a yacht. The way we go about, and I think most software companies in, you know, in, in any other industry as well, is that we have a, an, a platform for the yacht itself. That's what we call a yacht plan. And then on top of that, we have all kinds of modules uh, because the one size fits all also doesn't apply in yachting, obviously. And you want people also to go through a learning curve and they might have, have certain requirements or preferences. And therefore, if you do it modular, they can add up like a, a crew management or they can uh, add an accounting module or the ISM module. So, so that's, I think, a better experience also over time to, you know, to build a relationship with the customer and, and where they see then the value of our software. Yeah, and as you say, Keegan, in some, in some places you might even have security as an element that you might not have had 20 years ago. Fending off pirates might not have been on the list of, of yacht management tasks. That's really where, where I, I believe I come in quite nicely for quite is. You know, I've been on the other side. I know all the pain points. I've seen, you know, particularly with ISM and the, you know, flag compliance and, and managing your, your safety management system on board, which also, you know, ties into the security aspect of things. Some people are doing it really well. Um, and then on, on, the, on the flip side, the majority of people are kind of just guessing. And we're really trying to, you know, optimize those processes, make it really easy for captain and crew and yacht manager to just, you know, it's, it's just simple to put in, you know, you know, your drills and you manage that and, and, and just tracking of your certificates and doing your hours of work and rest correctly. And um, these are all key elements, um, you know, that fits into that safety management system that can, can be improved in the industry. And we, we're hoping to do that, you know. As these boats get bigger, it used to be that I'm, I'm more from the sailing side than the super yacht side, but 30 feet used to be 
feet normal, and then it was forty feet, and then it was fifty feet. And then it was, you know, it's um, these yachts are effectively, you know, small businesses or even large yeah. businesses. They've yeah. got a number of staff. They've got more staff than most small businesses. They've got more suppliers than most small businesses, yeah. um, and they've probably got more regulatory and compliance um, yeah. requirements than most most businesses do. So, as, as you say, a, a spreadsheet isn't necessarily going to cut it. Taking one one random example, I mean, mo- most most vessels, you know, fifty meters, which is kind of the average size these days, is running, you know, annually on 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 a couple of million million dollars a year, you know. So it's not it's not it's not you know chump change at all. Um, and, and like you mentioned, they've got to manage all this crew. They've got to manage all the compliance aspects that are continuously changing. Legislation, particularly for yachting, is continuously changing. You know. Um, so, so we're really trying to, you know, optimize these processes, um, and and that's really why we try to, you know, develop this single sign-on platform that try to covers all aspects of yacht management holistically um, to try and, you know, address these pain points and get a better solution. I noticed that you've got a lot of integrations, and and that's one of the things that creating software over the last few years has become a bit easier. You know, right. through APIs and and the ability to be able to not have to reinvent the wheel when it comes to something yeah. like foreign exchange, you can just do an API into Wise or Revolut or something like that, and yeah. and build something out more easily. How's yeah. how's that affected your your program in terms of developing the software? Yeah, for us, I, I think the uh, the the integrations are very important. I mean, technically, for us, it's quite straightforward because our, if you look at our tech stack and the underlying um, solutions we use to to build these native integrations is is uh, quite straightforward. But indeed, for the customer, I think it's very important because when we speak to uh, uh, potentially yacht managers or so people that run certain companies, they have already certain legacy systems sometimes in place, and for whatever reasons they might want to they they might want to keep it, and therefore with an integration we can um, make the data work more seamlessly. Uh, and therefore, we can help them with mapping of their workflows and identify where their efficiencies are uh, uh, to be gained. Yeah, And separately also, I think we want to offer a, a holistic solution. And therefore, you know, if they want to have a Dropbox or a Google uh, Drive installed, then we can do so. Or if it's indeed a CRM system like a HubSpot, then we can do so as well. So... It, uh, it just it's a broader value proposition in the end if you can op- offer integrations. If you don't have to throw out the legacy systems and you can continue some of those processes, as you say, easier to develop an integrated solution without having to build it from from scratch. What are some of the emerging technologies that you think will will impact the the yacht management space in the next sort of three to five years? I'm thinking things like IoT or blockchain, even. There, there, there's a lot that we're now seeing. A lot of different startups also applying in new, new technologies. I think first of all, the overriding aspect I think that everybody needs to be very conscious is still about data privacy and the cyber security. And well, it hasn't been really discussed too much in the industry. But if you look at how much private information is still being sent over emails and with it and and sitting in Excel sheets, so I think that right. as technology. Or, or as a business, you really need to address first and foremost. Of course, our business model is SaaS, so you have an, uh, with annual subscriptions, and you can really um, add users or yachts and and and, um, and build out and scale your business. So I think that's an important um, model and and trend in technology uh, that we're using. Like I think on for the industry at large, I think we see a lot around the IoT and censoring. So there are a number of startups now working on on uh, on real time having access to all the data in regarding of um, you no know, builds or, or or security cameras and bringing all that data into uh, into one one application. And that would also work very well with our solution because. Indeed, if you can monitor all the uh, data real time and then also plan against, for example, maintenance schedules. So when, 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 when you have the accurate numbers on the engine hours, you can know when the next servicing needs to take place or certain ex- in, inspections. So I think on the censoring side, we see a lot. And of course, we see also a lot around the electrification, you know, for, for sustainable reasons. And of course, the whole uh, 
batteries and 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 the digital digital side of uh, of the equipment is really taking uh, you know there's a lot of um, development taking place and, and and I think also as a software company we can capitalize on because there's more data available for for us to put into our application and enrich the system and then people to be more data driven in their decision makings you know and also trying yeah, to absolutely. make the data available and, and visual through dashboards so that it's more intuitive for people to say okay i need to take you know uh, this is a notification or a track here i need to spend some more time on this or that instead of that that data is buried and what about things like tokenization of of assets and, and things like that using using blockchain is that something yeah. that's being looked at yeah well we, we know one or two companies that definitely look at fractional ownership and how can uh, you know tokenization and these 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 general ledgers or blockchain how can that be used uh, for certificates and and, sh- and shares and so forth and again it's been quite widely applied or tested and to an extent i guess validated in other assets like real estate I think for yachts, particular, of course, there's still this challenge around uh, the capacity utilization because how many yachts are being used um, efficiently throughout the year or the season, not only by the owners but also th- with charters. So if you would have, if you indeed have a fractional ownership and that capacity goes up, then for sure justification and 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 opportunities to to apply um, you know tokenization blockchain solutions for that. And, and what about on the uh, insurance side? I, I know that in health insurance, they're using things like NFTs. Is, is that being used in the marine industry? Well, okay, I think insurance is a very interesting uh, sector, obviously. I mean, I, I think as a whole, and it's been, of course, quite traditional in the past because of you know, insurance, in, in essence, is risk mitigation. And I think that's also a big part of the culture, to be frank. So innovation, if you look in the financial industry, insurance took definitely some time to, uh, to pick up. But I think there's a huge opportunity in, in marine uh, insurance as well and, and on, on collating data. And I think uh, back to our previous uh, topic around d- digital data, yeah, if the digital data becomes available to, to insurance companies, uh, then you see uh, that they can, on the actuary side, can make better risk uh, assessments, price perhaps that risk more real time and give more bespoke uh, insurance policies to yacht owners you know at the moment it's still quite broad and general uh, but if you look at uh, what we call insure tech startups you see a lot of them trying to look be super data driven and personalize those uh, insurance uh, products um, yeah and, and i think that that will definitely uh, has a lot of use cases in in, in the in the yachting industry too if you've got a sailboat and you're racing it every weekend, then that's a very different story to um, having it sitting in the marina, you know, yeah. 50, 51 weeks, 51 weeks of the year. Coming back to your software, if you can prove, if you like, that the, the usage of the, of, the, of the vessel is in a certain way, then that can feed into some of those insurance products to sort of say, okay, well, this is how we tick the boxes in terms of the compliance, or this is how we tick the boxes in yeah. terms of the, the safety. But it's yeah. all it's all steps, isn't it? It's easy to run, rush ahead and run ahead on the roadmap. Okay, I, I think there's still a lot of pain points that are quite core to even the uh, basics of, of uh, plan maintenance systems and how do you right. really... Uh, provide a strong solution that that people can start with uh, and to really change the, their workflow but also their behavior yeah and the way they are then able to be edu- uh, and, and that they start implemented and, and the way they can collaborate and share fully digital I think that that there's still a learning curve and I think that's uh, that's also where a lot of the opportunity currently still lies. You're based in Singapore, am, yeah. am I correct? That's correct. Yeah. How's the how's the Asian market going from a from a super yacht point of view? Because it's yeah. it's often I'm sitting in Europe and it's often forgotten yeah. about, and not talked right. about what's going on over yeah. that side of the world. But I'm assuming it's growing. Well, it depends a bit what what metrics you look at, but but in general, obviously the the Asian market is very small compared to the Met or, or say uh, uh, Miami, Fort Lauderdale in, in respect of boats or people working in the yachting industry, but. I think, relatively speaking, it's definitely grown a lot over the last five, seven years. 
and throughout all the way from say China and Hong Kong to you know to to Indonesia. I think there are a number of factors that I think, uh, of course, a lot of ultra wealth uh, individuals here. I think this whole trend around explore yachts and new territories. Um, you see it also on government level, kind of if you look at Thailand or Indonesia, understanding that yacht, the yachting industry is part of the tourism and you need to be able to offer licenses for chartering and have to build in uh, and then look, proactively look at public-private initiatives around the infrastructure like marinas and so forth. So I think Asia definitely is uh, is, is growing. I think the interest also from from uh, from Europe and the US to to come and do um, cruising in in, in 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 Asia or into into the Pacific is uh, is uh, yeah is, is 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 very encouraging and therefore being in Singapore is actually quite a good uh, good base for myself. And just finally, what's the sweet spot for you guys? I think you said to me um, earlier you're sort of looking at a, a certain a length of vessel. What, what are you yeah. targeting in terms of your your sweet spot? Our focus is very much on, say, 24 meters and above, because then, of course, you have a yacht that's normally professionally run. There's a captain, there's a couple of crew. And, and of course, also regulation and ISM really comes into play, especially 24 up to, say, 50 meters is also a bit of an unaddressed market, because if it's over 50 meters, and I think a lot of the yacht managers come in, uh, uh, will be uh, insourced. Uh, you, you also talk about full uh, ISM. The complexity increases a lot. So between these 24 and 50 meters, there are a lot of vessels, either private or chartered, that definitely could benefit from uh, from you know software solutions like ourselves. Good stuff. Okay. All right, guys. Uh, thank well, you thank so much. You. Thanks, yeah. Kevin. Thanks, right. Keegan. Appreciate Cheers, it. David. Cheers. Bye. Bye. More information can be found in the show notes and on the website yachtbusiness.biz. As a bonus for this episode, an excerpt from the Palot podcast in which Corey Smith and I talk about how VR and AR technology can be used to display and sell very large things like yachts. This week is Boot. 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 Boot is the Dusseldorf boat show. It's one of the biggest, if not the I biggest. I was going to say like Das Boot. Yes. So it's if not the biggest boat show in the world, it's one of the one of the biggest boat shows in the world. And I was watching a video of um, a princess yacht, which was being moved. It had to go across the North Sea. It had to go up the Rhine. Yeah. It had to then be loaded onto um, with a massive crane. It had to be loaded onto this sort of tractor trailer thing, driven into the exhibition space, mounted in the exhibition space. And then the whole thing is going to have to be done in reverse to get it out again. What's the name of the boat? Twenty meters or something. It's a big. It's a big super yacht style thing. Princess yachts. Princess. I'm a. I'm gonna find it. If you go to my LinkedIn, you'll see that I commented on a video from Princess Yachts. Interestingly enough, I'm also working with a Danish company that do uh, VR and AR, and they're working with the oil and gas industry and wind farms and a whole bunch of things to be able to create virtual models of very, very large things. And then instead of having to take your very, very large thing into a trade show, you just take your VR goggles to the trade show and you walk your person around the very, very large thing at the trade show in in virtual reality. And there's a couple of big yacht companies that are doing that at Dusseldorf this, this year. Mm. Um, they've actually built virtual marinas with virtual boats and they're walking people around them. Now, let um, me ask you s- something. As a longtime marketing guru, uh, someone who I do respect in the marketing field and somebody who knows a- quite a bit about VR, um, have, have you tried this? Have you tried these goggles in, in any form? Yes. Yeah, I've seen the goggles. I mean, some of these guys are doing it, on, from, again, going back to the the pandemic, they're doing it just in 2D on a browser. From an experience standpoint, because, you know, like a buying a luxury yacht, that's a premium purchase. Do you think that the VR is as impactful of an experience as, or do you think it's a uh, experience that's as good as for the, from the marketing or the, the sales standpoint as do, bringing the yacht there? So there's a few things going on. 
one again, it goes back to the well, why are we doing it this way? Because we've always done it this way. Right, right. Right. We've always just stuck a big boat in a big shed. And let's face it, Dusseldorf in January is not warm. And it sounds it sounds exciting. Yeah, I want to go and buy a super yacht, but I don't want to go and sit in Dusseldorf in January to look around a boat in a big cold shed. Fair. Um, fair. <laughs> uh, that's fair. Yeah, I get I, it. I'd much rather go to the Dubai boat show, which is in March the 2nd, I think, March 2nd and 3rd in Dubai, and wander around a boat in the sun, in the warm. Yeah. That, that would be a more useful experience. You know, you can put in your smaller boats, the ones that you can put on the back of a truck and you just – but if it's something that you literally have to sail across the sea to get it to the exhibition centre, there's some big – sustainability problems with that as well right in terms of the right. amount of fuel that you're burning both on the transport and on everything else i figure if you can build a pretty decent model in vr i'll send you a link there's a french catamaran company that's do- doing it pretty well not in vr but they're doing it on a so on a browser you go in and you it's like google maps you walk around inside the boat and the finishes look quite good you can see the textures of things you can see what it would look like from certain places on the boat, what the view is out certain windows, where the beds would be. So it's like a – it's the same as a brochure. If you buy a boat off a brochure, which some people do, yeah, or you buy a house off plan or you buy a, a card by seeing the, the spec sheet, then why wouldn't you use VR? And I, pro- I assume for people that buy these type of things, that's probably not uncommon. I mean, sales has been done on ca- in catalogs for years. Yeah, that's that's true. You know, you see the widget in the catalog and you go, yeah, I'll have 20,000 of those. Well, this, you can have it in your hand in 3D in virtual reality or, or augmented reality. So the augmented reality case study is let's say you've got the hull of a boat and that boat is in situ in the in the exhibition. You can use an iPad or an iPhone to do an X-ray of the hull of that boat, see through the hull to what's inside, the engine compartment or the uh, struts or the engineering configurations which gives you an extra level of understanding that you couldn't explain if you didn't have ar so you know vr and ar have got two different user cases i think there's a very big sustainability and cost saving play on the vr side for very big things you know if you're talking mining trucks or wind farms or to fly someone to a wind farm (laughs) in the middle of the north sea to show them what the wind farm looks like and how it works yeah, it's an incredibly expensive and dangerous, potentially dangerous exercise. <laughs> right. If you can build that entire wind farm in 3D and walk them through it in a safe environment and they don't have to get cold, it, sounds, it seems like a no-brainer to me. Yeah, and I think that's the application for that. Is this your thing for 2023? ARV? Yes, one of them. One of them. That's it for this episode. Thanks for listening and thanks for all your comments and feedback and emails. To find out more about how VR and AR can fit into your yacht business, get in touch. The Yacht Business Podcast is produced by Pilot Media for Pilot Media Network.